Well, we went to Fat Moe's for burgers <laughs> and burned up Carrie's brakes on the way back. <laughs> and, uh, you know, those kind of memories kind of, kind of come back because a lot of these songs were written on, they were great days with people. And we had a good time. Mm -hmm. I think you wrote a song, you got an idea of Wendy's for a great song, didn't you? Um, it evolved out of Wendy's. It was I Know Heartache. To say it's a Yeah, that was a, that was a great meal, Wendy. <laughs> I think I know a heartburn, Google a twist of the words. That's really not the story, but I mean, Wendy's did factor into that. Let's go back, Rory. I know I did a little research on you, like I was studying for those SATs or something, maybe not that quite. But um, in the early days, you were in Cleveland. You were working, uh, tell a little bit about that. Well, I'm from, <clears throat> I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, when I graduated from uh, school, um, it was clear I wasn't ever going to get a job with anybody. So my mother, uh, my grandfather was a railroader, so she helped me get a job at the New York Central. And I traced cars um, back at that time. And uh, um, I sat in a little room with three other guys. and headphone and people would call in and say, we lost a load of lettuce, or where's the fruit? You know? And I'd have to make calls all day long to find out where the cars are. They didn't have computers or anything like that then. So I just, uh, I wrote, the contents paper was real long paper like that. And I used to just take it home and write and write lyrics when I got back home. Pound. So you're already getting paid to write songs, sort of. In a way, yes. <laughs> Publishing deal with the railroad. I like that. Yeah, I've done that too. Has anybody ever wrote at work? It's okay, your boss is not here. But uh, so you were writing these lyrics at home and taking them home, putting a melody to them at night. Um. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad. It's very bad. <laughs> so you're writing at home. You haven't moved to Nashville yet. Any of those songs get cut? Uh, one song uh, I wrote during that time got cut um, by two brothers named the Robertson Brothers, and it was called Cleveland's the Loneliest Town in the World. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it, it came out. I mean, it came out. And I said, nah, I don't think so. It went back in. <laughs> <laughs> Then I quit the railroad. Yeah, no feature in it. And, uh, and um, I ended up working for Mercury Records in Cleveland. Did you? As a local, local promotion man. And so you're working in, uh, in records in Cleveland. How the heck did you get from Cleveland to Nashville? Or how did that help you to begin with? Well, um, I'm wondering if I should say what it really is. Actually, I, I, uh, I was a local promotion man there, and um, they, they said, you have a choice of what you want to carry. And they had four labels. Three of them were red hot. One of them was in bad shape, and that was Mercury. So I took the Mercury job because I figured, uh, hey, we're all the way down. We can't go any lower here. <laughs> If I, get, if, I, if I even go into a, a radio station, we look good. So um, I worked for Mercury. I took the Mercury line on. And then some, some people from Cleveland got promoted up to Chicago. Uh, I was promoted to a national promotion man for a great guy named Lou Dennis at Smash Records. And so uh, I was a national promotion man. Then Lou left to go to Warner Brothers. They made me the product manager, which it didn't take them a long time to figure out they made a terrible mistake. So uh, then um, they needed uh, um, a person in Nashville at that time. So I came down here to become a national sales and promotion for country product. 
and that's where I, I hooked up with Jerry Kennedy and the Mercury Gang down here. And the most important thing from my experience of that is um, I heard an awful lot of bad records. And bad records because they just didn't sound very good and, I, and, and some of the songs didn't sound very good. So I, six years of being with Mercury, I, I had a pretty good idea what a bad song and a bad record sounded like. So it really kind of put my ears in a place where I was always trying to kind of write above that. So the whole time were you writing songs while you were working? I would, yes, yes, I was under the under my wife's um, family name, which was Hughes. I wrote under the name Mary Hughes, and I had a record with Nora Wilson on Smash uh, uh, called "Love Comes But Once in a Lifetime," and. Uh, my name on The Most Beautiful Girl originally, way, way back when, was Mary Hughes. And then Al Gallico, who's a great publisher and a great guy, he called me and said, Hey, this thing's going to be a big hit. You got a chance right now to change, put your name on it. I said, Put it on. So uh, that's. Then I left Mercury uh, and uh, kind of went out on my own to try to get a, a deal. Did you have any mentors when you came to town, and maybe how did that happen? I just had, I, I just made a lot of friends. I did, I, at that point, I didn't have any mentors, uh, but Eddie Rabbit was kind enough to, to co-write with me. And we wrote a couple things. One got recorded by uh, uh, Elvis, uh, which they played earlier, Patch It Up. And then we got another thing recorded by on Atlanta by a guy named Terry Stafford. And Eddie was really kind to me. I mean, he, he put up with me. And um, I learned, I started to learn about, really learn about songwriting from, from him. So was Patch Up the first song she got cut? And maybe how did that happen? Well, um, <coughs> I was in BMI at the time, and this is an, an example of what not to do. Um, I was in BMI at the time, and uh, they said, hey, I bet you that's going to be a single. So uh, I thought, this is it. This is the big bucks. So I then at that point, I said, you know, it's probably a good time to kind of just wave goodbye here and move into the big time. So the record came out, and uh, my first check, I don't know, it was for $500. And, and, I, and I went to uh, I went to him and I said, $500? How could that be? And they said, well, sometimes it goes like that. So now I didn't have the millions. I thought I was going to, it was a two-sided record, and the other side really got more play, which was you don't have to say you love me. And um, so it kind of taught me a lesson to, uh, be cool, be real cool. <laughs> so so uh, I then spent the next year looking for other writers and trying to get a deal. And I met a girl named Gail Barnhill, who um, we wrote some songs together. And uh, we ended up eventually with a deal with uh, Chapman Music. So you got your deal. What happened there? What was that like when you first went to write for a publisher? It was wonderful. Uh, it was wonderful because uh, you don't. You, the company that uh, Chapel was a, the man who was uh, president of Chapel. I was signed by Henry Hurt, who who has signed more than one Hall of Fame writer, and uh, I, I was sort of the first person, the second person they had there as a, as a writer, and uh, I, I needed two hundred dollars a week, and. Um, Henry said, he wants $200 a week, I, you know, geez, you know, we can probably get him down a little bit. And the publishing company said, if any of you ever talked to a publishing company, you probably haven't heard this. Uh, Henry, give him the $200 a week. We don't want any of our writers worried about money. <laughs> and, uh, that's the way it was the whole time I was there for 20 years. They, they were absolutely wonderful. 
They bought my house. They, they did an awful lot for me. And I think that uh, it's really hard to get those kind of deals today. It's been a great company. We're talking, we'll go into co-writing in a minute. Have you written all but about two songs that were co-written of yours? You had, did you have a couple cuts that you wrote by yourself? I had one cut by Elvis uh, called Dear Loves My Long Time Coming, which is about my, my oldest daughter uh, right on the cusp of her being born. And uh, I wrote a song called Smile For Me, which was written when my wife, Rita, sitting in the back, uh, back there with uh, Cliff Aldridge and Julie Aldridge. Um, she was she was pregnant at the time. She looked absolutely beautiful, so I wrote this song, Smile For Me. And that was recorded by Lynn Anderson and then Olivia, Olivia Newton-John. Let's talk about You've been married, you married your colleague's sweetheart. Is anybody married here? Anybody married or been married or whatever? <coughs> let's branch off a little bit from the songwriting, but let's talk about how important and how do you make that marriage work when you're in this crazy business? Or should we get Rita up here? No, but. <laughs> well, she probably could say yeah. what it's like. Um, I think the one constant, when I met Rita in college, um, I said, I, I want to be a songwriter. And she, she actually thought that was a great idea. And uh, so we got married, we moved to Cleveland. And uh, I said, you know, they're saying you need lead sheets to get people to listen to songs. And she said, I'll do them. So we bought an old piano. She sat down and she did lead sheets for me for years. And uh, the, big, the one big constant here is that Rita is a victim of music. She loves music. She listens to it all the time. Uh, somebody asked me, does your wife always go to the rounds or when you do something? And I said, the only time I can ever remember her not just automatically being there was one time when she was sick. And um, she's really the brain of our family. Uh, and uh, she's a... Uh, I've written with people where they've told me, you know, my wife doesn't care what I do. It doesn't mean anything. Music really didn't mean anything to her. And I think that if, if I was married to somebody that music really didn't mean much to, you know, I probably wouldn't, I mean, for all I know, because it's a, it's a hard life. I mean, I wouldn't be married still. I might be married to some four other people. <laughs> four other people and uh, begging for money. <laughs> Over the years, have you had uh, any challenges in the business and maybe how you worked through them? So an old doctor friend of mine used to say, yeah, every damn day. <laughs> <laughs> what are the, the tough challenges that you had? Staying in it. Yeah? What keeps you in it? Uh, I'm addicted. Yeah. I'm addicted. And I, I was right today, I was, I was writing with Charlie Black and Phil Vassar. And I said, you know, I think maybe I'm just addicted to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 I mean, I think, I think the greatest thing in the world is to get in a room with two or three other people and challenge yourself to, to write something that somebody else might think is good enough to record. One of my co-writers is here tonight, uh, Linda Smith, and, uh, Lunch is a big deal, right? <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's just a thrill to be with people in your, it's like, you know, working on a sand castle. One person puts some sand here, and another one puts it here. Pretty soon you get a castle. And, it, and it's, uh, it's, just, it's just a joy. It's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of hard work, but it's, it's a lot of fun. How important have friends been on your journey? Um, friends that you met co-writing, they involved into great friendships, and you've had uh, several of those. Can you think of any time where one of your friends had a challenge and they called you, or you called them? <coughs> Just the importance of the friends on the journey. You mean, call me about a song, or call me about something yeah, anything. deeper than that? Yeah, deeper than that, if you present Yeah, I mean, uh, I've had, I have three friends. 
<laughs> but uh, the, they're go-to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, where it's the kind of thing that uh, it's it's got to go, soul to soul. It's there's who I am, who are you? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you who I am. They tell you who they are. Yeah, uh, probably four people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, they're everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's really important. Yeah, I don't know if you'll ever make it through this if you don't have. Somebody that you can lay your head down on the table and just cry. Amen. I've had to do that a few times. It's, it happens. I don't know if that's anything that ever happened to y'all, but while I'm on this journey kind of thing, but that happens and your friends do come along. Let's talk about co-writing. When you go into a co-writing... I do want to say one thing if we can go back to. Okay. I did have a mentor, but this is this was after... I was not at the railroad after I got out of Mercury. I had two guys that were, well, actually three people. Uh, a friend of mine, Matt Gallen, was a program director of that time, uh, KDA. He, although he wasn't necessarily, he was a program director, he was a mentor. He really went out of his way to help me as much as he possibly could. There was a guy in town named Don Gann. Don worked for Aka for us for years. He, uh, he took over the creative part of Tree for a long time. He's the guy that brought Sonny Thought Morton back to town, back from the dead, and said, you need to be a songwriter, and Sonny went on to have a phenomenal career. Don Gant, Mac, introduced me to Don Gant. We, we kind of immediately hit it off, and Don was extremely instrumental in my continuing to believe in myself. He cut some of my songs on Hickory Artists, and, uh, he tried to get me to sign at Aka with Aka for Rose, and uh, I said, Don, I need money. And he said, geez, man, we don't give any money. So he took me in to uh, Wesley Rose, and he said, hey, we, I really want to sign this guy. And, uh, Wesley knew I had been in the promotion end of the business and talking about money. And he said, well, we just don't give draws. So I said, well, I'm not really sorry. I can't sign here. And uh, Don Gann called Henry Herc. At the time, Chapel was beginning to sign people because they had just come to town. And Don Gann called Henry Hurt, who uh, he knew really well, and he said, Henry, you really need to sign this guy. This guy is going to be a great writer. And I got a call that afternoon. And uh, the other person that was tremendous help to me was a, a lady named Diane Petty, who uh, not only ran the ABC Publishing, but uh, was instrumental in a lot of artists getting deals. And Diane really uh, went down the road for me. So there are three very, very important people in the room. How would one find a mentor in this town? If you're new to town, you've been here a while, how does a mentor come along sometime? I wish I could see all of you better. Uh, I know I can, but I want you to know that I wish I could. But I hope. I hope my words are touching your ears. Um, I have to tell the truth. I think if you first come here to town, you're not going to find a mentor. I mean, uh, mentors generally show up after you've been here a few years and somebody mentions you to somebody or somebody hears you playing. And, um, well, you know, well, like it, uh, at your place Sunday, that firefighter, mm -hmm. I heard, you know. Uh, I think, I think that, that's, that's, that's the way that happens. I think you, I think you really have to, first of all, prove you're serious about being here. And that generally comes years after you're in. And, um. I think the best way to start to get in that position is to play out as much as you possibly can. And um, try to find people to work with, or other writers to work with, who can teach you something. You know, mentorship, I mean, Don and, Don and Mac and, and Diane weren't necessarily songwriters, but songwriters who are a little further down the path from you, uh, 
and not that hard to become accessible to. Just develop some relationships there. And, you know, like I've heard you say before, don't bother them. But just kind of be there, you know, ask, ask good questions. And, and uh, eventually, you'll kind of, you'll fall into the class of your, you know, like the NFL, uh, uh, the draft of 2010. Those people will all come up together. And everybody in this room will, will all come up together. And as, you, as people are coming up, if you keep contact with each other, then there's help from, from the people who may be a little bit more fortunate than you, a little luckier or whatever at that time, and then the, 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 the love will fall back. It's a good way of looking at it. Let's talk about co-writing, something you've had tremendous, tremendous success with. Let's talk about maybe your first co-writes when you were writing with hit writers. You know, how, does, how did that happen and what were you thinking going into the room? And what did you do? How did you prepare for that? Actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Eddie Rabbit was the only hit writer I ever wrote with. I mean, where he was um, further along than me as a writer. Where I started writing was I, I met a girl named Gail Barnhill. And Gail had really great lyric ability, at the, and I had some lyric ability and musical ability. And, and, and we, put our, we put what we knew. I, I say this, when you write with somebody, or whenever I write with anybody, I want everybody to know that I don't know anything, you don't know anything, but, but together we just might know something. So Gail and I, together began to really know something. And we, we started to get some songs recorded. Um, uh, she got signed to, uh, she, she, uh, Paul Ritchie, at Paul Ritchie Music, who was with In Business of Pete Drake at the time, started publishing her stuff and Pete Drake started working on mine. And then we both left that to go to chapel. But we really brought each other along and we, uh, we really helped each other, so that's where that's where the the, the real co-writing thing really started for me. So I guess going along with that, you'd say try to find somebody who. Well, the best place to start that is I wrote it right down here, ladies and gentlemen. A thorough, thorough and thoughtful assessment your strengths and weaknesses as a songwriter. What are you really good at and what, are you, what aren't you so... Whoa, you must have been falling asleep when you're up that line. What are you really good at and what aren't you good at? Because you'll want to try to, after you do that assessment about who you really are, where your real talent is, and you say to yourself, you know, I'm a little weak on words. I'm not bad, but I'm a, I'm a little weak on words. So you'll want to start to look for somebody who's got a little bit more snap on that end of the spectrum for you. And then try to hook up with someone like that. And then they're weak somewhere, believe me. There are very few writers that are absolutely fantastic at every aspect of this. And so you'll start to help each other. And, you know, you never know. Sometimes when you walk in that room, you know, I've always felt like you, two people go in a room to write a song, they create a third person if, they, if they're willing. And that third person sometimes can say, hey, I've got it. And takes you all the way home. Same thing with three people. So I just went from Gail Barnhill, then I, I met Henry signed uh, uh, Johnny Wilson and Gene Dobbins. And the three of us got together and uh, Gene, Gene was a clutch, he was, he was kind of, Gene was the kind of writer who when you needed that line and you're going, duh, he'd have a line that would just knock you out. And Johnny was really good at a lot of overall kind of stuff. So um, we really, we wrote a lot of songs together and we got a fair amount of things recorded. And then I, I met uh, Charlie Black and Carrie Gillespie. They, were, they came to chapel and um, actually I wrote, uh, Shadows of the Moonlight with Charlie, 
And Henry said, why don't you guys get together? So he came over to my house. And uh, we're sitting on the couch. And I mean, he just started moving shadows in the room. And I went, oh, man, this, this is too, this is too, too lucky. And then he, after we got about halfway done, he looked out the window. And he looked back at me and he said, Murray, I don't know if you know it or not, but your wife's running down the street with a broom chasing something. <laughs> it was our it was our God. So, but that was his, his introduction to Rita. Um, and then Charlie and Jerry, Jerry and Charlie had written a lot, and they got together with me and we wrote a, a bunch of good things. Which sort of leads me into another thing about co-writing. Uh, I, f I figured it out that if you write with one other person and they're writing with somebody, what are the chances of you writing with that person that they're writing with and go to a three? And then if that works, it might be possible that you and this person work together, you and this person work together, and the three of you work together, and you really pump up your volume on the number of songs that you write, and then those spin off to something else. You take one of those people into another situation that you know about, and you just start to build that till it becomes like a circle of co-writers that you don't ever get in anybody's way to the point where they're saying, is he back again? And you just keep on building that, that paradigm out. And um, that's the way, that's basically the way I built my career. And um, I wasn't the first person that ever thought that up. Uh, they weren't. Uh, I used to be, uh, uh, because I promoted Noro's songs, and um, I, I, Al Gallico published some of my songs. I was really good friends with Noro Wilson. And I just, just from being in the promotion and in the business, I noticed that these guys would all write together. I mean, this is the honest to God's truth, as I know. You know, Billy Sherrill would have a two o'clock session for Tammy. He'd call up Nora or George Ritchie or Carmel Taylor or someone like that and say, hey man, I don't have anything. Get over here. <laughs> and they'd run over to his office and they'd knock out some of, some of the most god-awful hits you ever heard in a short time. But then those other guys would, you know, Nora and Carmel Taylor and George Ritchie to get together and write a song. And they just, that's just kind of the way they did that because they all had jobs in the business which allowed them time to do that. And I, I just kind of got it by osmosis. You know? Well, let's talk about a. Uh, okay, so you and Noro. Let's, let's talk about that me. Come on. Let's talk, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you and Noro became friends like this through the working together. Yep. You got together, wrote a pretty good song, I think. It's one of my all time favorites. Thank you. To talk about writing that. Most beautiful girl. Uh, Nora and I wrote uh, uh, wrote most of it in uh, Chicago. Then he came back to Nashville. I wrote and sent him what I had written after that. Um, then um, Billy Sherrill uh, said, "I don't think it's right." So Nora and Billy got together and they they put the cap on him. I made that into a Billy Sherrill's a genius. Uh, uh, they made that into a worldwide. Do you have any any other tips on that sheet? I know that you've tips. done a lot of work on this. Advice to the songwriters. There is oh, this is pathetic asking for 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 your indulgence, but. Is, is, is this interesting at all? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You love me. Let me go. Let's talk to you. I'll go on to some of the more boring things. Uh, I wrote this down. This isn't quite as serious as it sounds. It's your rise or demise as a writer. And uh, it's how you treat your co writers is paramount. Um, I use a lesson from my own life. I, uh, my big lesson, learning the hard way. Uh, I, I, I got in a room with Charlie Black and another writer who's still a very, very close friend of mine. And uh, he, 
he came up with something, and I fell on the floor howling and laughing, and uh, it turned dark very quickly. As I could tell, I re really hurt him. He didn't say he really hurt me, but I could tell, man, I have really punched this guy in the face. And uh, it was a hard lesson to learn because I, I don't, I, I mean, uh, I, I mean, he, he's my friend and, and everything, but, but it, it kind of, it kind of ruined Corey in there. <laughs> so uh, I, I've, uh, ever since that time, uh, I've always treated whatever my co-writers come up with, with the utmost respect. It may not work. Uh, I may say something like, you know, I really like the way that sounds, but I'm wondering if we could kind of finesse it a little bit more this way. Uh, I, I just always think that what they're handing, what they're saying is a gift of some kind. And, and uh, writing is much like you take uh, a little kid at a window, a boy or girl, and someone outside the window is going, come on out and play. You look out the window and you look up at the sky, it's a big sunshine day, and the clouds are just wonderful, and you say, I'll be right up. Sometimes you look out the window, and you look up in the sky, and it's rainy and dark. And the little creative kid says, I ain't coming out. And it's your job as a co-writer to make sure that somehow the sun is shining for that other person, and the rain isn't falling, because once once we as children, creative children, uh, get afraid of being hurt, we're not going to let anybody in there to hurt us. So th that, to me, is a really important uh, key point to establish, take it upon yourself, the responsibility. I'm going to put this person at ease. I'm going to, I'm going to make this a happy room. Um, One thing that I think is really important <coughs> is what I call the Paul Ritchie factor. Maybe some of you have been through something like this. Um, when Gail Barnhill and I, we wrote a song we thought was really great. We took it to Paul, who's a great song guy. And uh, we said, well, what do you think? He said, well, it's pretty good, but what do these two lines mean here? What's this all about? And I said, well, well, yeah, well, that's, that's, he's really in love with the girl, and he really wants her to get her to, to live with him, and, 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 uh, and that's what that's all about. And Paul goes, oh, okay, I get it now. He said, well, I'll tell you what we do. Every time we send this song out, we'll put a little card in with it that says, when you get to this part, the guy's just trying to get the girl to fall in love with him. It's the greatest songwriting lesson I, I ever learned, I ever had. Yeah, and that lesson is make sure that every line in the song, on the paper, says what you really meant it to say. Because I know for myself even now, sometimes you get an idea in your head, and when you look at it on paper, it doesn't quite add up to what you thought. And unfortunately, it's your job to work on it until it does. And that, that's one of the things that just make you a, a better writer over time and you work harder and harder and harder. And it, it, it's infective, it, it infects your co-writers. Um, the other second short, you know, you're, sometimes people just come into your life for no reason at all. It seems like it is. And uh, Don Gam was made head of ABC Records with Ron Chancey. And I went to their big party. I'm standing there and a guy could just come up out of nowhere and someone says, um, this is uh, Russell Brown, one of the writers. Ty L. Ribbon, you know, I said, oh, I don't remember. And it just out of nowhere, this guy says, you know, you know what the biggest thing about songwriting is, the most important thing? He said, editing. He said, the, the songs that have the best editing do better. And the writers who are willing to ask the really hard questions all the time, he said, those songs go on to be bigger songs. And, uh, and he was gone. And, and I never forgot that because it, it, made, it made really hard sense. Because I'm telling you, the first time you're with somebody who's a pretty good writer and you say, you know, I just don't know if this works right here. 
Uh, and people say, what do you mean? That's not a good sign. <laughs> but the majority of people will say, well, okay, well, what do you think's wrong? And you say, I think it's wrong right here because it doesn't do this back to this. And that, that makes everybody a better writer. And I think, I think it's... I think it's one of the most important uh, things I've ever heard. It's hard to be a great editor because then some people think, well, he's just an editor. But um, if two writers or three writers are in a room and they're all willing to ask really hard questions till, till everybody agrees it's done, uh, that's probably going to be a pretty doggone good song. Uh, I think I have one more. Go ahead. Where's a quick one? Listen to all forms of music. Country, jazz, hip-hop, urban, R&B, Broadway, rock and roll. Study how words are put together. Uh, my favorite book for that is by a guy named, he just passed away, his name's Gene Lees. He wrote the jazz newsletter for years and years and years. And he's written three books and one of them was called The Singer and the Song. And there's about a hundred page essay inside that book where he explains why we use English words to express certain things and why we use French derivative words to express anything sexual or love. And it's very, it's just fascinating. And uh, I even think Broadway, you should listen to Broadway because one of my favorite records of the last few years is that Gwen Stefani Wind It Up. It's right off the sound of music. If you listen to that song, it sounds like it came rolling out of the sound of music. So, I mean, the more music you listen to, the more you're exposed to, the more latitude you have to go someplace with your musical ideas and with your lyrical ideas, and you can let your mind just go as far out as you want it to. Uh, be likable. That's sort of like with Paramount, but it's be likable. Always, always be aware of the effect that your actions and words are having on other people. Because we're all creative children and we all get our feelings hurt and innocent.